Okay, so let's uh, wrap up this workshop with the last session. So in this session, uh, I want to have essentially a discussion, but slightly guided discussion. So I'm going to put up a few slides with some topics which I would like to discuss. Uh, but then we can, uh, you know, tailor it to whatever people here want to discuss in more detail. So I will spend a few minutes on each slide and then open it up for discussion. Uh, but before that, uh, let me mention a few things which we have been setting up. Uh, there have been a lot of requests for uh, running the workshop on Windows. So we will put up, uh, you know, how you can handle these things on Windows. So we have it somewhere here, if I can find it. Here, lab setup instructions on Windows. I, there may not be much here yet, but there is enough to get you started. Uh, so far, Hadoop on Windows, uh, we have not got it working. Some people are trying it out. Uh, so if somebody succeeds, let us know how to do it, and we'll put up the instructions here. The other things are relatively straightforward. Uh, then the lab setup instructions for Linux, currently empty, uh, but the session that you had in the morning, those uh, things will be put up over here. Um, this is uh, slightly different from the Windows lab setup. The Windows, I'm going to change the title. The Windows lab setup is for this course. This is actually system administration. The other stuff is already there for Linux. And all the other stuff you have used already. And finally, I'm putting up a few things uh, down at the bottom. The last topic was a discussion on research and teaching. A few people have been asking me about resources, uh, various kinds of resources. I'm working on this. This is a work in progress. Uh, but let me just show you what I have done so far, which is not much. But I have put up links to our courses here. Uh, the courses which I teach, um, and also some of my colleagues teach some of these courses. So the uh, first course is undergrad uh, database and information systems course. So there is a Moodle page for it. You can uh, click on that link and then uh, click on guest login. You should be able to view the things over there. Uh, hopefully you will be able to see most of the stuff that is in there. If there's a problem, let me know. Then the next thing is, uh, the implementation techniques course, which uh, is basically a database internal course. It's a second course, and it goes into full depth of database internals. And there is a page which uh, shows the, uh, how we organize the course, and also some extra material on PostgreSQL internals. This course is primarily based on, well, it covers the theory of internals, but there is an extensive project for this course which uses PostgreSQL. And the goal is to get the PostgreSQL source and modify it in some way. So there are uh, instructions, uh, laboratory, uh, uh, sorry, project uh, suggestions and how to go about uh, doing these projects in PostgreSQL. So if you are teaching an internal course, some of the material here may be useful. Or if you have uh, students who want to do uh, B project or something in internals of databases, there are some good suggestions here. Uh, there are uh, many, many more things which can be done. So the, uh, there is a link to a PostgreSQL wiki, which uh, is basically PostgreSQL developers saying what all would be nice to put into PostgreSQL. So that's another nice resource for figuring out what to do. But, uh, but these are not trivial in the sense that uh, hacking PostgreSQL internals takes a fair amount of effort. It's not a course project for a regular undergrad course. It, it's maybe for an internal course, especially postgrads. The third one is a, a research uh, paper-based course, which uh, surveys recent or old uh, standard papers on various topics in data management. Um, since I teach that course, it tends to be very, pretty biased towards my research areas, which are query processing. And this year, there's been a very uh, significant bias towards big data also. So if you're interested in these areas, uh, there's a list of papers there which uh, can, uh, it's like a guided reading list which can help you with it. And there are also talks on every one of these. So these are talks which either I gave or students in the course gave. So every single paper has a talk associated with it. 
So you can actually browse the talk and get an idea of what is going on in this area. This is by no means an exhaustive collection of papers. It's a, a selection which is, like I said, biased towards my interests. Other people may have other interests. So what I will do is I'll try to add uh, more links to similar courses in other places, wherever they're available. And if you find any links, let me know. If you think it should go into this, let me know, I will add it, if I think it's a good link. And finally, uh, there's some stuff on database conferences. A lot of people want to know how to do research. The best way to figure out how to do research, the first step actually, is to find out what is going on out there. And how do you find out what is going on? Uh, one way is to uh, see the websites of the leading conferences and also journals. But in computer science, uh, what happens is the people generally submit the most uh, recent work to conferences first, and later on they submit more polished versions to journals. So if you want to know what is the most recent stuff, conferences are usually a little more recent. And uh, you know, you, at one side you don't want to focus only on the most recent, you know, on the most uh, hot topic of the day. You don't want to overdo it. On the other hand, uh, if a topic has been kind of cold for 10 years, uh, the chance that you'll be able to do something new in that area diminishes with age. So the newer the topic, the more chances for doing something. But that doesn't mean you need to change uh, every year with the flavor of the year. Okay, so that uh, I'll add more resources here for both of these. Yeah, question? Ah, yes. Let me talk about that. Oh, in fact, let me also plug our COMAD conference. So tier one and tier two, tier one are very hard to get papers into. All, they also tend to have, um, you know, maybe slightly better quality papers than tier two conferences. And um, we have a conference here uh, in India, which uh, rotates around different places in India, called COMAC, Conference on Management of Data. Uh, so that is uh, run by the CSI Special Interest Group on Data, which currently I'm. Uh, chair for that group. And uh, this year, in 2013, December, this will be in Ahmedabad. Okay, so please do come for this conference. This conference has a mix of uh, keynotes, tutorials, and research papers. So you'll get a flavor of many things in there. Uh, the tutorials and industry sessions too, let's not forget. So you'll get a very nice sample of what is going on out there. If you want to uh, get into a research area, there are usually Tutorials on several, three, four different research areas, which lead you fairly deep into the research area. There is a good starting point for learning more about the area. If you want to know what is happening in the industry, there are industry speakers who we have invited to come and give talks. And then there are keynotes, which we have uh, basically, we recognize some of the eminent people across the world, and uh, we get them to come and give talks. And then in the research sessions, we have two kinds of things. One is contributed research papers. So if you have done some interesting work, consider submitting it to COMAG. The deadline is usually sometime in uh, August, July or August. So there is a site, comag.in, uh, which uh, I don't think it has details of this year's COMAG yet, but it will come up, keep a watch on it, and uh, do consider submitting a paper. In fact, we have multiple tracks there. We have research papers. We usually have an applications track where people who have built significant applications it need not be new research in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, something which the research conferences would accept. But if you built an interesting application and would like the world to know about it, or at least people from India, if not the whole world, uh, th this is an international con. We do get papers submitted from across the world. Um, uh, so uh, you can get visibility for interesting applications which you have developed. So do consider uh, sending papers in those categories also. Uh, so, um, I have put a sh very short list here. Now, these are subjective, but there is a Australian core ranking of conferences in computer science across all branches of computer science. And they list conferences as A, B, C, and so on. So tier one here is essentially their A level. Uh, tier two is their B level. Uh, tier three is C level. Uh, though up to C is what they consider good conferences. And then there are others which they don't rank, which are 
uh, they don't consider as uh, as of now as being good enough to be in the ranking. This is on Moodle. Or oh, the core ranking. Yeah, I can add that. Just send me an email to remind me if I forget. Uh, but you can search for it. Australian core, C-O-R-E, ranking. OK. Any other questions on this? Good. Uh, there are many more uh, sites for research. Uh, so these conferences uh, are run by, uh, the AC Sigmod conference is run by the ACM uh, Special Interest Group. And they have, in addition to the conference proceedings, they have other information also there, blogs and other stuff. OK, so now let's get to the uh, last part before we have a final wrapping up, which is uh, to start off the discussion on research and, and teaching. I'm going to start with research. So let me put up the first slide here. So here are a bunch of topics which I would like to discuss. Uh, first of all, there is all these meta questions. What is research? What constitutes a publication? When do you know you have done enough work to have uh, submit it as a publication? Uh, and then there's something which uh, I think is a very serious issue. Professor Fartak mentioned this earlier, uh, plagiarism for assignments. Unfortunately, we have a very sad situation where people are plagiarizing papers. And there are journals which will happily publish papers regardless of the fact that they have been plagiarized. So I have seen uh, at least two or three cases involving my own papers. I don't know about other people's papers. Uh, <laughs> so people who publish it, and there are these journals uh, which uh, basically make money from authors. <laughs> and they will publish anything you submit to them. And you can put it in your resume. They are generally called International Journal of XYZ. So I had a, a, a professor from Hyderabad who said IJ Star Conferences, Interna I mean, IJ Star Journal, International Journal of something or the other. Um, so there are a lot of disreputable uh, journals. That doesn't mean all the papers they have there are disreputable, but they don't care, basically. They'll publish anything as long as you pay them money. And um, so that is abused. Uh, so that is something very serious because it's uh, spoiling India's name. Uh, and the problem is, uh, you know, China also, Chinese people also do this. There's a lot of plagiarism there. But the only good thing going for them is it's all in Chinese. We don't know what is going on there. We know it's happening, but there's no clear evidence. Uh, but these uh, journals are open access journals. So they say we are open access. So guess what? Google crawls them. And if you search Google for something, those papers do show up. And uh, they do uh, get exposed as plagiarism. So... It's a, it's a very serious matter in many ways. Okay, and a lot of this unfortunately is driven both in China and in India by the fact that our governments have uh, in their uh, wisdom or I would say wrong wisdom decided that a PhD is a must for promotion. And that's very bad, it's devaluating the whole thing because we have excellent teachers who, are, you know, who want to teach and a lot of institutions are about teaching. And then there are research institutions. We shouldn't be mixing that up and putting pressure on people to do uh, research and publish something or the other without actually having achieved anything. It becomes paper generation. The point of research is not generating papers. The point of research is generating knowledge. But we have a system which is pressurizing people into generating papers rather than knowledge. So this is something I think we should push the government to tackle, I feel, but uh, give me your uh, suggestions on it. And I have a few bullets about uh, how to do research. We'll come back to it. Um, this, this is by no means exhaustive. Just a few point, thoughts that I had. Uh, you can read it, and if you have comments, we can discuss. So I'll stop there on this slide and open up the floor. So what software is used to detect the plagiarism in IIT, sir? What software do we use for detecting yes. plagiarism? Uh, so if you're talking of plagiarism of research papers, you have to compare it against everything on the net. So for this, there is a very popular site called Turnitin. Authenticator. Turn it in. Uh, that Authenticate, it's a commercial huh? Authenticate and a commercial software is available. And Viper yeah, open source is available. 
Uh, so the, I'm not sure about the open source version of it. The problem is it needs a web crawl to detect plagiarism for these kinds of things. Uh, so it's difficult to download software and run it because you know, it has to have access to a lot of journals out there. You can't just do keyword search with Google and get results. So uh, you pretty much have to go with one of the commercial offerings at, for this kind. There's a different kind of plagiarism which is student assignment. If you give a student assignment and you want to check if people have copied, the first step is of course you should make your assignment different enough from what is out there such that students can't just take something out there and submit it as their own. If you have done that step, then there are other tools which will compare uh, different student submissions for plagiarism. Those there are tools available, both uh, you know, free and commercial, uh, both are available. So name some so, tools, sir. Name some? Tools, sir. Um, so a uh, lot of people here have been using uh, something called MOSS. Mos That's MOSS. Yeah, uh, and I, I'll put up links on it uh, with a proper link. So there are a few tools which you have to register for, which, but otherwise free. Then there are some which you can download, but you have to do some work. And then there are some which are commercial. Turnitin can do all of these. Okay. Uh, so many colleges are using it. Mm. And many journals, the reputable journals, are using it to uh, check submissions to see that they have not been plagiarized. Sir, one, as a student, once I complete my paper, how can myself I can check? Is it? Worth how do you check by yourself? Uh -huh. uh, that's a good question. So, if you did not copy from a paper directly, if you thought about it and you wrote it, you know that you didn't plagiarize. A few of the things we use so that we acknowledge them. Like we are from this, yeah. you are taken from this author. That is okay. From that, I have improved my technology. So I acknowledge the author. Yeah. No, like, see, if you have taken a definition or huh. an algorithm from somewhere and you have cited it, saying that here we give this algorithm from some other paper, and then you proceed to say how you can modify it. That is not plagiarism. That is, you are you're giving something and okay. citing it. You say somebody else did it. Yes. This is not my contribution. This is the background. That is fine. Now, if you run a plagiarism detector, it will find these also. But as long as it is limited and it has been cited properly, that is not considered plagiarism. But if you reproduce a significant part of the paper um, with or without citation, then there's a problem. And the worst case is just reproduce a whole paper. I saw a very nicely written paper in one of these IJ star journals, and immediately you become suspicious. Uh, I found it because uh, it cited a paper of mine, and I have a Google uh, registered for it to notify me of any papers that cite my papers. So it notified me, and I said, hey, that looks interesting. Let me take a look at this paper. And it's an IJ star journal, and it's a very nicely written paper. I said, wait, <laughs> I'm sure this is. <laughs> and I, I Google the first sentence in that paper, and sure enough, I find a paper published somewhere else with, by a friend of mine, which <laughs> had done all of this. And they have just copied it straight. Sir, so can I write on the paper that name, a software name you told? I will put it up on uh, this site. But yeah, if you, since yeah. you asked, uh, this is off. I'll put it here. So the commercial one is, is turn it in, but you need an account. Uh, now, uh, I think MHRD has, or somebody has purchased it. I, IIT Bombay has a license. Um, and some other places have licenses. So you could request somebody in one of these places to run your paper through it if you want to check. The, the point is if you wrote the paper, you would know. Uh, no. But supposing a student wrote it, you don't know. Maybe the student copied it. In which case, you can run it through this. So you can, uh, I, I don't know if they give you trials of this, but you can always request somebody somewhere to run it for you. Thank you, sir. Excuse me, sir. This is regarding that. Uh, uh, fake journals. Yeah. So I want to give some input to that. Yeah. In our NI University website, mm. they have been listed a number of journals with impact factors. So yeah. if uh, the people, those who are interested in good uh, publishing in good journals, they can refer that particular website. There are the list of uh, uh, journals along with the impact factors. So yeah. through that, we can avoid that fake journals like that. There yeah. are more things regarding that uh, flagrism checking tool. So we are using white smoke 
uh, type of tools, which is checking not only plagiarism, mm -hmm. and although it's checking the grammatical errors also, how to write the papers, mm -hmm. in a, uh, and LaTeX also might be the good tool to write the papers in IEEE format, some other format. Yeah, thanks. Um, so if you send me a link to that tool, I will add it here. I have not used that, uh, the first tool which you mentioned for grammar checking. Of course, you use uh, Microsoft Word, it automatically highlights grammar. Open Office doesn't do such a good job, but, but, I mean, uh, but it does check uh, spelling, of course. And uh, since you mentioned LaTeX, uh, that's a very nice typesetting package. For research papers, it's a lot nicer to use LaTeX than Word. I mean, I've tried both. Um, and Word uh, really sucks for writing research papers. In fact, I was visiting Microsoft for a year. And I found that people in Microsoft use uh, LaTeX for technical paper. Many of them, <laughs> not all. <laughs> Hello, sir. I have a uh, question other than research. Hmm. Uh, actually, I want to know ki what is the significance of the XML in database, uh, okay. especially XML, yeah. uh, especially in temporal uh, statics collection, a okay. temporal type of the database. Uh, like network traffic and uh, statics and generated by the simulator. Okay. So these are two separate issues in some sense. They are orthogonal. XML is very good for data interchange. Okay, it's uh, um, a way for two different applications to talk to each other. They cannot agree on a relational schema, but it's a lot easier to represent uh, common data in XML schema. There are standards for this, and even if there isn't a standard, Many tools will uh, export data in some XML format, which they define. But they have given you what this, uh, the XML uh, schema is. They, they have explained what the structure means to you. So now you can write an application which takes that XML and ingests the data into your system. So XML has been very, very successful in this field. It has also been very successful in document representation. Now, all the document formats which are used currently, whether it is uh, Open Office or Microsoft's current formats, they're all based on XML. So it's very successful that, in that sense. XML was considered also as an option for storing data in databases. And every major vendor built a significant part of uh, their, their database today is handles XML per se, as opposed to relational. But in the market, this is kind of flopped. Uh, not all that many people are storing their uh, regular data which they process through the relational system, they, as of now, very few people are storing it in XML format. Uh, there are many technical and non-technical reasons for this. Uh, but at one time, XML was considered a very hot area for research in databases. Today, it's kind of petered out because the market interest in running, uh, you know, storing data in XML and running database queries has come down. That doesn't mean it's dead. It may come back at some point. That's it. Now, with respect to temporal uh, data, that is totally orthogonal. Uh, so temporal data has a very long history. Um, and it has been, an, there, there was a lot of research on it at one point. Um, but surprisingly, it had very little impact, unfortunately, on uh, practice. The theory was there, but very few databases actually supported uh, temporal data types beyond timestamp. Timestamp is a very weak form of it. What you need are time intervals or time ranges for it to be more useful. And then the SQL language uh, extensions were proposed to deal with time. Uh, but very few people implemented it. That is now changing a little bit. Um, many more vendors are now paying attention to temporal data. Uh, the, uh, mo uh, previous release, the most recent stable release of PostgreSQL 9.2 has a data type called range which is a range of time. Now, they don't do anything at the SQL level with it yet, but it is a built-in data type. And they have some SQL syntax to deal with it. So you can actually do some interesting stuff with it, uh, but it's not yet fully integrated with SQL. I think that's part of their strategy to eventually support temporal data. Uh, basically, it is used in uh, uh, like BSD systems. Uh. RRD database uh, okay. that generate the, uh, uh, collect the uh, database and uh, generate as a histogram, output as a histogram, especially using the cricket match and IPLs for uh, showing the graphics. Uh, 
तो इट हैज ऑल्सो अ गुड और जस्ट राउंड रोबिन डेटाबेस आर आर डी आर आर डी टूल आई डोंट नो अबाउट इट वी विल लुक इन टू इट ओके थैंक यू सर एस टूल्स फॉर स्पेशल डेटाबेसेस ओके दैट्स अ गुड क्वेश्चन आर देयर टूल्स फॉर स्पेशल डेटा सो एक्चुअली स्पेशल डेटा यू नो एवरीबॉडी यूजेस टुडे यू नो इफ यू हैव अ स्मार्टफोन यू हैव अ मैप एप्लीकेशन सो इट इट हैज बीन वेरी सक्सेसफुल इन मेनी लेवल्स इन टर्म्स ऑफ टूल्स व्हिच यू कैन यूज फॉर इट देयर आर क्वाइट अ फ्यू there are uh, geographical information systems uh, there are many tools uh, you can look it up on the web uh, and then there are geographical extensions to databases so um, postgresql and oracle both have uh, add-ons which can deal with uh, spatial data there's a extension called postgis which deals with spatial data oracle has its own thing uh, the last time i used postgis uh, i found the performance was not very good it was good for learning but it was not quite uh, you know production ready at that point it might have changed since then but sir, at least for some kinds of research you can use it sir to do something new in a particular area it requires complete domain knowledge it yeah. takes lot of time to read the things yeah. like for doing my ms all those things if we able to come with some incremental things which is new it's not so significant but it is a little bit new yeah. with idea yeah. it is considered a research or not Okay, that's a very good question. Um, what is research, right? Mm -hmm. If is it something we, so in an ideal world, uh, the only research will be ground-breaking, amazingly uh -huh. new research. Uh, but that's not how research progresses. Well, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. So, uh, and it may never happen in one's lifetime. Also, uh, so a typical publication has some interesting ideas. a few interesting idea sometimes even just one interesting idea and then once you have that core idea you build around it you uh, you know figure out how to make it work properly with other existing ideas how to integrate it with existing systems uh, there are a lot of details in putting it to to make it actually work properly and then you have to compare it with alternatives anything you do usually there is some other way of doing it so you have to show that this works well compared to the others so there's a performance study so when you put all of this together what at a core is a small idea becomes a medium sized paper say 10 12 page paper conference paper so most conference papers are like that they have at their core a few interesting ideas and so if you have a few interesting ideas which are new you uh, you know once you work out all the details and show that it actually has some benefits you are ready to publish a paper now if that idea is really deep you can target a tier 1 conference if it is a reasonable idea you know, some novelty you can target uh, say tier 3 kind of conference or tier 2 depending on so even all, inc incremental work is also good then yeah all work is uh, you know most papers advance the field in some way so there is an existing technique you figure out how to do it better in some cases so that is incremental in some sense but as long as there is some novelty to it it is publishable but you, of course how much is that delta if it's a really really trivial idea is not going to get published so it has to be it's hard to define what is big enough to publish uh, that's a judgment call uh, so there are reviewers for conferences who decide whether your idea is interesting enough to be worth publishing and sometimes it's rejected from one you send it somewhere else they may think that the first person might say no i don't think this is new enough the other person may say yes this is worth publishing So if you're not interested with a degree and I want to do something new, in the contribute yeah. to that particular area, yeah. Okay, then that case, what I should do? So the first thing is to learn about the area. You can't just, uh, you know, uh, so most areas somebody has already started working. It's very hard to pick an area where nobody has worked because there are a lot of people who are working full time on research. So the first step is to see what research is there in that area. today that's a lot easier because we have all these search engines uh, and everything is online so the first step is to find out about it and the problem in most areas is there is so much research uh -huh. so you pick up an area and then you have to narrow 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 so um, uh, like they say a bachelor student knows nothing about everything <laughs> a phd knows everything about nothing <laughs> so ultimately your area is very narrow but you know everything about that area 
so that's uh, you, you kind of drill down. You look at an area, read papers, then drill down to a sub area, read papers till the point where you realize, okay, here is an interesting thing which people have not really thought about or the solution they have proposed are not good enough, you can improve on it. And that's where you get a research publication out of it. Thank Hello, you, sir. Hello, sir. It's you, sir, Mike. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir. According to you, which one is best tool? And Oracle, SQL, or Postgres? <laughs> we, sh we should have a, a beauty contest of the tools. <laughs> Just a minute. Uh, no, I do have a serious answer to that. Uh, so it depends on your application. The open source tools have been steadily improving. Postgres now has a lot of features which it didn't have earlier. If you asked me this question, uh, I think about six years ago, I would say for any high availability application, don't use Postgres. Don't use MySQL. Use, go with Oracle. Okay? So our uh, financial applications in IIT Bombay, uh, we chose Oracle. Uh, this was about 12 years ago. We didn't choose PostgreSQL. However, for our academic data at the same time, we chose PostgreSQL because, uh, you know, that data can be regenerated. If it fails today uh, and I've lost a few hours worth of data, it's okay. I can regenerate it. I have the paperwork necessary to regenerate. Worst case. It has not happened so far. Worst case, I can do that. But today, even PostgreSQL has high availability features. What do I mean by high availability features? That means if you, you can couple two PostgreSQL systems, you run a transaction on the first one, all the logs that it generates are shipped automatically to the second one. If this machine dies now, the other one is up to date as up to the last log record that it received and it can take over. And there are tools now, there's a tool called Heartbeat uh, and other tools which can automate the process of uh, switching over. So our application which was using this one can now switch over to use the other one with almost no noticeable downtime. So this year, gate, you know, gate is a huge undertaking. The gate uh, application for gate, you know, gate had about a million candidates this year, all applying within a one month period. Okay. And the tail end of that period, uh, they had uh, something like, uh, I don't know, uh, they were looking at 60,000 per day or up to some 6,000 or more per hour or 10,000 per hour at peak time. It's a fairly high intensity site. And they use PostgreSQL with high availability for that. Uh, so that was uh, done by CDAC under the guidance of one of my colleagues, uh, Umesh Bellur, who was, he's a computer scientist. Uh, he was also chairman of GAME. So they used it, worked beautifully. It handled the load, no problem at all. Is there any data uh, data repository for relational database? Any data? Uh, re data repository uh, for relational database. So we can download and run uh, test our uh, approaches. Uh, I'm talking uh, PhD purpose. Okay, uh, that's a good question. So if there you... is a flat files is available, but we are not finding the relational database. That's okay. So that's a good question. What kind of uh, uh, test databases do you test your things on? Right. So there are uh, several benchmarks called the TPC, Trans let me write it here, PC or Transaction Processing Council. Oops, sorry. Okay, I don't know if you can read that. There's a set of benchmarks and each of those benchmarks has an associated schema and a program to generate data. So a lot of papers and databases use one of these databases to test their ideas. So most of my papers, for example, use one of the TPC schemas and the data generator to generate large data. They, they, you can generate it to whatever size you want, one gigabyte, 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, whatever you want. And then you can uh, test your things on that. But these are for a few schemas. Each benchmark has its own schema. Size, size of the file uh, means uh, uh, in terms of the records. Yeah, so uh, they define it in terms of total data size, but you can control it. You can, each of these benchmarks, okay. you can generate the data uh, where the total data size is one gigabyte, 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, one terabyte. I mean, the generator program can generate it to whatever size you want. They give you the program. You can download it and run it. Free, free, is it free? Yeah, they're free. Sir, yeah. sir, 
one query, sir. Yeah. For every research we do, we do we have to develop a mathematical model to say that that's a real problem I have solved? Do we have, must have a mathematical pro uh, model to back it up? Is it a must when we do our research? Um, not exactly. In computer science, there are many things where you don't, there's no mathematical model per se, uh, but you, are, you have to abstract away what you're doing. So you may be um, motivated by one specific application, but you have to abstract away what you're doing so that you can handle a variety of applications. And in computer science, usually there's an algorithmic component to it, uh, but it's not like the traditional mathematical uh, things necessarily. That, but uh, in data mining, it is different. Uh, there, uh, some of them have a lot of probabilistic uh, models associated Probably. with it. Uh, so that's a different catalog. So it depends on the sub area. If you're working in networks, there are systems papers, but there are also some more theoretical papers which build queuing models. So it depends on your area. There's no one solution. So can we get any Indian data sets where we can do research on data mining? In uh, UCA machine learning repository, most of the data sets will be on other country. Yeah. We are not able to get any free data sets pertaining to India. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't work in data mining, uh, so I'd have to forward this query to my colleagues. Uh, what I know is uh, National Informatics and NIC generates a lot of data sets, but I don't know if they will share it with you. They're not I sharing kind of doubt it. Not That's sure. a problem with data sets. Okay, nobody wants to share their data. No company wants to share its data because they'd gain nothing and they stand to lose. So there was a very famous incident. Uh, there's this company, America Online, uh, which is kind of half dead now. But at one time, it was one of the biggest internet companies in the world. Uh, so at some point, they decided uh, they wanted to encourage people to work on uh, search. And to help them, they would publish uh, query logs. People uh, used to query on AOL. So they released query logs. And uh, somebody got these query logs and found out that they could identify exactly who had run many of those queries. And some embarrassing queries are in there. And they could identify an individual. The person who released the data was fired from AOL. Okay, so he, that person is actually an Indian. He had good intentions at heart, the good of the community, and he paid for it with his job. So uh, you know, that's an example of uh, why nobody wants to release data anymore. Uh, that one or two attempts ended up in uh, problems. So it's very hard to get data sets. Uh, so that's not a good answer, but uh, so the other thing you can do is many companies are willing to share data with you as long as you don't reveal it to somebody else. You can work with the company to do something. Okay. So if you have contacts in companies which have data, you can work with them to analyze their data. And they will allow you to publish the findings without publishing the data. Yes. That's the agreement you'll have to work out with them. So I know some people have done those kinds of things. Thank you, sir. So there are many companies in India which have a lot of data today. So if you have contacts in those companies, you can try them out. Hello. Uh, sir, actually you have listed the different courses which you, would, uh, which you used to conduct. Yeah. But for outside participants, what is the procedure to get enrolled for your course as well as the different courses for their research topic, okay. uh, so which has been conducted by IIT uh, professors? Yeah. Yeah, these courses are only for our students. Um, there was an attempt made many years ago when distance education, I mean, Professor Fatak, when he started the distance education program uh, around 1999, I think. Uh, 2009 was this teacher teacher, but he started distance education back then. And at that time, uh, we actually shared this course with outside participants. Uh, but it didn't work out very well. Um, so after that, that was kind of abandoned. So at this point, uh, there is uh, no infrastructure to do the course formally. You can see what we did in the course. You can, uh, I mean, you're all teachers. You can run similar courses. But if you want to take a course, uh, there are these massive online courses from many universities. IIT so far has not offered such a thing. I think Professor Fartek has started thinking about it. So at some point, it probably will happen. Uh, but right now, uh, online courses uh, have not yet come out. But it will happen. And the government is serious about it. Uh, in fact, I think uh, one of the ministers uh, is uh, going to be meeting some of these companies that run these online courses 
and Professor Fartak is going with him, and Professor Fartak has already started discussion. So it will happen sooner or later. Uh, so there are these companies, Coursera is one of them, uh, which came out of Stanford. So they offer a lot of courses. You can take the course for free, uh, but you, you have to pay for certificates. So that model is now available. In fact, what is interesting is many of our own students have been taking those courses. Okay. We offer an equivalent course here. They may do that course and do the other course. Or maybe they didn't do the course here because they, uh, you know, they, they can only do a limited number of courses, register for a limited number of courses. So they did some other course here, then they go do an equivalent course online. So th that's a nice avenue now for learning about a new area. There are a lot of courses out there. Sir, is business intelligence related to big data analytics? Yeah. If yes, how do they both fit in? Uh, how do BI and big data fit in together? So there's a, all the traditional BI with OLAP and uh, other tools. Um, those work with moderate amounts of data. Now uh, the big data frameworks have tended to work with much, much larger volumes of data. And uh, till now, there has not been much interaction between the two fields. But obviously, people want to be able to do BI on big data. So one of the first steps that has happened is that now there are SQL interfaces to big data. Uh, we covered Hadoop in the labs. There is a Hive project, which I mentioned earlier, which is SQL. And then people are building stuff on it to couple business intelligence with Hive. Uh, so that is happening, and uh, it will be an important area. Excuse me, sir. Whether the implementation is necessary for publishing the journals? Uh, yes, pretty much. Uh, most Many of the journals, without implementation, they are published. Uh, so like I said, if you publish in uh, IJ Star, they'll publish anything. Uh, but if you want to publish in a venue which is actually selective, uh, the, these days it's very hard to just tell, give an idea and say publish it. If you're a theoretician, you come up with this brilliant algorithm or uh, something like that. Uh, you come up with an amazing proof of something, like uh, Professor Manindra Agarwal. Uh, you might have heard of his IIT Kanpur. Uh, he and his students came up with some amazing results, which hit the you know New York Times headlines and so on. Uh, so that kind of stuff will obviously be published without any implementation. But if you're doing systems work like databases, uh, you pretty much have to implement your system to show that it works. Just an idea is not considered good enough. Maybe a good idea, may not be, but people will say, prove your idea works before they will publish it. Sir, how do you answer that fifth point, sir? Should we push dropping PhD as a... Uh, which one? Should we push for dropping PhD as a requirement for promotion? Yeah. So what do we do about it? Ah. Um, this is my personal feeling that, uh, you know, this should not be coupled so tightly. And there are a few others who have also been talking about it. Now, what do we do about it? I don't know. So I wanted to get feedback from you. What do you think? You think it should be kept or dropped? Dropped, sir. Dropped? Reason is few people will be interested in teaching, few people will be interested in research. If you combine yeah. both, both will not do anything. Yeah. You, you might end up with the worst of both. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know what is the solution to it, but people have been talking about it. So. You know, eventually, these things you, you have to keep talking till it reaches a critical mass. Uh, enough people feel that uh, something should be done. And the first step is, of course, to say, you know, why is it a bad? It seems like a good idea. You know, they do it in the US. Why shouldn't we do it here? Um, and uh, arguments against that have to be built up. Part of that build up is to show what is happening with all these um, fake journals. And so you told that it is there in the US. In the yeah. US, to join an academy institute, you would have to complete your PhD and join. Correct. In our case, it's like if you have MTech, you can join. Correct. Parallel, you have to work, you have to do research. Neither yeah. I can do justification over my teaching, nor our research. Yeah. It's hard. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible. Many people have successfully done it. In fact, um, I think Professor Fatak and Professor Sarda, this was long back uh, in the 70s, uh, they were working here as a faculty with an MTech and doing their PhD in parallel. Okay, so that doesn't mean it's not possible, but it's all of you who are doing it know that it is hard. 
Uh, it's a lot easier if you're working full time on a PhD. Uh, so that model makes more sense. And we don't generate enough PhDs to man so many colleges. So uh, you know, my personal feeling is this should be delinked. Um, so there may be research institutes where a PhD is a requirement for joining. And for regular colleges, PhD should not be a requirement for promotion. If you because do a good job of teaching, I feel yeah. that should not bar you from being promoted. Because many of the institute, like even our institute, like they're forcing per year, you have to publish one or else no appraisal. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very sad state and it turns into uh, people publishing nonsense in, or even worse plagiarism in meaningless places. It turns into an exercise where even the people who are doing it don't want to do it. You know, they know it is useless but they are being forced to do it. That's really sad. Is there any solution? The solution is… As a faculty, can I do something so that the solution is that? Yeah. Uh, one thing is to make noise about it in various fora. Okay. So that the noise reaches back to people who made this decision in the first place and they uh, revi review their decision and change it. UGC or AICT or whoever, I think, who, who made the decision? UGC. Right? AICT, sir. Six, AICT with made Six pay implementation with yeah. fifth pay is not compulsory. Yeah. As they did the six pay implementation, they made it compulsory. Yeah. So I think uh, if you have contacts in AICT, keep reminding them that this is a bad idea. And I think uh, it's also important that people from uh, IITs and other places make a noise also. If you say it, they will say you are lazy. You don't want to do a PhD. <laughs> if we say it, uh, you know, it may carry more. So I, I just put it up to get your feedback. Thank you. Any other? Teaching. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> I, I put it here because it's not as contentious. Um, oh, went back to the beginning. There. So th there's not much here. Um, so, b but there is something important which I want to make, uh, especially in the uh, second point there. So first of all, uh, you know, it's a big problem. All of us know it that our education is turned into rote learning. You go mug up something, reproduce it in an exam, and you will pass. And uh, somebody showed me a question paper from their university, and on a hundred mark paper, there were options where only 10 marks required you to actually solve a problem of some kind or do a design or write an SQL query or something. The other 90 marks I think were all, you know, just remember something and come and reproduce okay, from the book or notes or whatever. Um, so how many of you feel that your university's question papers are like this? How many of you feel the university's question papers make the students think when they answer it? Good. I'm, uh, it's good to see that there are at least some uh, quite reasonable number of universities which make students think. But I have seen Mumbai University. Is any of in the second category from Mumbai? Yeah. That is okay. That is something which you have to do anyway. The question is, what does a hard question, easy question mean? Uh, and many universities, including Mumbai, from what I have seen, it turns it into something which you can just memorize and reproduce. Anything which involves solving, you know, writing a query, anything which requires thinking is thrown out essentially. And there's a huge pressure that students will fail, you should not put those kinds of questions in the paper, and it's a disaster in some sense. So the universities which are autonomous can escape from this. So how many of you who raised your hands are from autonomous institutes? Yeah. Bloom's taxonomy, sir. Hmm? Sorry? Bloom's taxonomy. Analyze, remember, understand. Yeah. So part A contains the remember and understand question, yeah. and part B apply, and part C you are having analyze and a yeah, excellent. type question. So I think autonomous colleges, uh, that's a good thing. So I, if it's in your hands, I hope everybody who's from autonomous college is following these principles. Yeah. Any other comments on this? Yeah, if you're in a university, which is following the rote learning thing, again, make some noise. You know, it's not easy. I know that there is a lot of commercial interests at work. There's a lot of uh, pressure from students. But if we don't do something about it, who else is going to do it? All the other interests don't care. Uh, the only people who care are us. Um, I had uh, uh, several teachers from Mumbai University lament about this, that uh, it's turned into this situation where they want to teach their students something, the students don't care because they're going to tuition classes. 
which prepare them for the rote learning. So this, here's a teacher who is enthusiastic, wants to teach, and uh, the students don't really want to learn because that's not what is asked in the exam. And they, they were quite sad about this. And so I think if that is happening, I'm sure it's happening in many places. So please make some noise and do what you can to change it. Okay, so that's uh, the other part, uh, you know, laboratory assignments and so on. This is a more practical point there. Um, so uh, cheating in assignments is a fact of life. It happens everywhere. It happens in IIT. Okay, our students are as bad or worse than anybody else. Okay. Uh, but having seen that, we have been trying to do certain things to reduce this. It's actually the people who are most upset by it are not just faculty, but other students. The good students get very upset by this because they are seeing people cheating and getting away with it, and an honest student uh, gets a lower grade as a result. So it really uh, bothers them even more than it bothers us faculty. Um, so what can you do about it? Um, I'm sure there are many things which can be done. I'll just put a couple of points here. For software assignments, there are tools for plagiarism checking, uh, which uh, we mentioned a few. Uh, we'll put up more links. So we can use those. I, I, uh, many of us use these tools to check if the things have been copied. Uh, the second thing which many of us do is make sure that for anything there is a viva. You can't do it for every single assignment, but at least for projects and things like that, students should be able to come and explain what they have done. If they have copied, most of the time they have no clue what is going on in there. You ask them a few questions, even a five, ten minute viva, it, it just shows up. Okay. Some, there are some smart students who copy something, read it carefully, understand it, and get away with it. But at least they have shown they can understand it. It's not, uh, you, know, you can't catch every single case, but it at least catches the people who don't understand what they're doing. So that's something we uh, take a lot of efforts on for projects and so on. And one more thing which I found useful is, uh, I don't just say submit a final project. I say submit a project one month from the start. It has to be an incomplete project. If you submit a final project at that point, I will get suspicious. You know, few people are very smart and can do it, but most can't. If you submit nothing there, and finally submit a polished product at the end, obviously I will get suspicious. But most people don't do such things. They do build part of it and submit it. And you can see the progression. Uh, and it's clear that they have worked on it, not just copied it. So I'm sure there are other ways. So I'll stop talking here and let you talk. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. While we're taking the project, we put this review system. Like we have two or three reviews, like one with the guide, and there is one person from the department go and check whether the project is up to date or not. And then second, they have to submit the undertaking kind of thing from close signed by the guide that okay, this much work is already done. Mm -hmm. And then second level, we had again the review, and on final submission, we check take three or four review in concern, and then award the marks. This is one thing I feel like is going to stop this plagiarism and the coping. Every time they have to show the progress in a step-by-step -step manner. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Yeah, I agree. Hello, so from the beginning of this workshop and earlier also, we have got this impression that nowadays most of the contents are available online, and even whenever we are taking classes, the slides or prepared course materials we upload earlier than the class. Correct. So there are at least ten percent people in the class hmm. in the uh, lower side. Mm. Uh, they are always interested to explain everything in the class. But all other students, they are always very much interested in practical works and ready in problem solving. Yeah. And there is a, the, the, for those 10% people, uh, personally myself always in a dilemma that what to do take that explanation in the class, then these good 90% people in most of the cases they are bored. So that's a very tough point to uh, get myself uh, teaching that how I should be giving the knowledge to those people. Just please say, show a light on that. Yeah, this is a hard problem. You know, all of us face this. Uh, we have very smart students. We have very poor students. So one of the things with Professor Fatak was talking about, uh, I'm not sure in this workshop, but somewhere else. Um, so what, uh, what uh, he uh, does in his course is to have extra lectures once a week for the weaker students. Um, either he teaches it or uh, TAs are there. So. Uh, class help outside class because if you slow down the class too much then you have a problem um, so this is very uh, important and good for the introductory courses 
for the um, you know later courses, third, fourth year courses, uh, we don't do a good job of this. I mean, so we teach somewhere in the middle, and uh, the uh, projects usually give opportunity for the very smart students to do something interesting uh, that keeps them engaged with the course, the fact that they can do something. And the bottom end, uh, you know, case by case basis it happens. So, yeah, others can shed light on this, what they do. Uh, uh, sir, my question is related with the teaching learning methodology. Uh, it is in the professional studies, especially in engineering, how can we ask students or promote innovation process in especially UG? Because in the university curriculum, there is no place for the innovation. It's not research, it's pure innovation. The new yeah. idea, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, we uh, confuse uh, research with just papers. I mean, innovation is a yes, much sir, better not term. research, innovation. Yeah, so I think that is very important. So in fact, um, I think, uh, you know, PhD is very tightly coupled with this thing called research. But innovation is something everybody can do. Even an undergrad student can innovate. So I think the system should actually reward this kind of innovation mode. If you can build an, uh, you know, an application which serves a need, I think that should count for something. If, if, so for your promotion, for example. Supposing you build a system which does something interesting and useful, uh, that should count as much or more than a research paper published somewhere. That, it could be a software, it could be other kinds of innovation. Um, so, yeah, uh, as far as student innovations go, uh, we find that almost every course we have a project associated with it and they do innovate in it. So the project is, in many courses, open-ended. They can come up with ideas for what to do. In the database course, people have done excellent projects. They've built huge applications. Um, they, they've written in, in a course, they're doing five other courses, but I've had groups which write a 70-page system requirement specification and 10,000 lines of code, and it all works beautifully, nicely designed. So students really, you know, some of them are fantastic, and they learn about new tools. Almost all the new tools which I learned about, indirect, eventually it came from students who first found out about those, used it in their projects, and showed that it actually does something useful. And after that, we took it up and made it standard part of the course. Sir, uh, more relatively for the colleges where we do not have the campus facility, like the colleges in metropolitan cities like Mumbai, right. the students used to travel a lot. So right from, right from 9 to 6 or 9 to 5, uh, students have, do not have much time to work on that. So right. if I have the campus facility or hostel facility, the s picture would be much pleasing. Yeah. So this is the point we are trying to do something for this. That's a good point. It's not easy to solve. But yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the, the other thing is students are able to work with each other at any time they want. If they go home, they are cut off. But these days with the internet and uh, phone and things, it's actually a lot easier for them to work uh, from home and to cooperate. So I think that is partly solving our problems. Okay. So uh, let's wrap up then. So I'd like to thank you all for coming and staying, all those who are here especially, for staying till the very end of the session.